It is the best-selling book in history. No volume ever written has been more loved and quoted. And its words, sometimes simple and sometimes mysterious, should always be studied carefully. It is the Bible, the Word of God. Welcome to Bible Answers Live, providing accurate and practical answers to all your Bible questions. Our phone lines are open. If you have a Bible-related question, give us a call now at 800-GOD-SAYS. That's 800-463-7297. Now, here's your host from Amazing Facts International, Pastor Doug Batchelor. Hello, friends. Would you like to hear an amazing fact? The only significant land on our planet that is not owned by any other country is Antarctica. Antarctica is covered by 90% of the world's ice, and that ice also represents 70% of all the fresh water in the world. As strange as it might sound, Antarctica is essentially a desert. The average yearly total precipitation is about 2 inches, and although completely covered with ice, all but 0.4%, Antarctica is the driest place on the planet, with an absolute humidity lower than the Gobi Desert. How odd that the biggest desert in the world would also contain the most fresh water. Did you know the Bible says there's a day coming when the deserts of the world will be converted into lush gardens? Stay with us, friends. We're going to learn more on this edition of Bible Answers Live. You're listening to Bible Answers Live, accurate and practical answers to your Bible questions. Welcome, listening friends, to Bible Answers Live. If you have any Bible questions, we'd invite you to give us a call. It is a free phone call. We have lines open, and a really good chance if you give us a call now, you will get your question on tonight's program. The number is 800-GOD-SAYS. That's 800-463-7297. We'll bring your question into our studio. Not only can you listen on this radio station, but we are streaming on Facebook and that would be both the Doug Batchelor Facebook account, the Amazing Facts, uh, Amazing Facts Facebook account, as well as on YouTube. If you go to the Amazing Facts YouTube channel, uh, you can also watch. And we, we're kind of, we've moved into a new studio, and we're getting acclimated here, and uh, soon we're going to be broadcasting this on a number of Christian channels as well. And my name is Doug Batchelor. My name is John Ross. Good evening, friends. And Pastor Doug, as always, we like to start the program with prayer. Dear Father, we thank you that we have this opportunity to be able to open up your word and study. We thank you for the technology that allows us to communicate the gospel to uh, those who are listening, wherever they might be. Father, we ask your blessing upon the program. Be with those who are listening and guide us all into a clearer understanding of the Bible. Mm -hmm. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, Pastor Doug, I know that you like stories dealing with different explorers and adventurers that went to far off places and uh, one of the areas of exploration very popular in the early 1900s was down to the Antarctic. It was a place that very few people had actually mm -hmm. gone to and some great stories like Shackleton and others who tried to actually not only go to the Antarctic but actually travel across the Antarctic and some did, mm -hmm. some were not successful. But it's a very interesting place. You think of cold and you think of ice and snow but you don't always think of it as being dry. Yeah, if you're going to go down there, you better take your hand cream and your chapstick because they say the air is extremely dry. It'll dry out your, your lips and your skin very quickly. And, of course, the coldest temperatures ever recorded on the planet, I think it was like 120 degrees below zero Fahrenheit, um, are in Antarctica. But uh, it is technically, it's a desert, but it sits on top of miles of frozen fresh water. Mm -hmm. And I think in some places it's two miles thick the ice, if you can imagine that. And uh, it makes me think about those promises in the Bible, many of them from the book of Isaiah, that in the earth made new, there will be no barren wilderness. There'll be no desert. I'll just cite a few of them here. Isaiah 35, 1 and verse 6, the wilderness and the wasteland shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. For waters will burst forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. Isaiah 41, 19. And I'll plant in the wilderness the cedar and the acacia tree, the myrtle and the oil tree. I'll set in the desert the cypress tree, the pine and the box tree together. These are trees that required, you know, moisture. And then the, the best one that's the clearest is Isaiah 51, 3. 
For the Lord will comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places. He will make glad her wilderness like Eden and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in it. Thanksgiving and the voice of melody. So when the Lord first created our world, it was not, you know, there were not these extremes that all kind of happened after the environment was distorted following the flood. There were not these extremes where it was burning hot or freezing cold like Antarctica or the uh, Sahara Desert. But it, the, the whole planet was, you know, a beautiful garden. And uh, the Garden of Eden was the center and it was especially beautiful. But God is going to make a new heavens, a new earth, and it talks about it being filled with beautiful trees and friendly animals, and it will be a paradise. And friends, this is not pie in the sky by and by. This is a very real place, and God's design that you can be there. If you'd like to know about the home of the saved, we have a free offer. We have a book. The book is called Heaven. Is it for real? And that is our free offer this evening. We'll be happy to send that to anyone who would just call and ask for it if you're in North America. The number is 800-463-7297. That is our studio phone line here if you have a Bible question. The resource phone line is 800-835-6747. And again, you can just ask for that book. It's called Heaven. Is it for real? I know we have some who are listening outside of North America. You can also read the book by just going to the website, amazingfacts.org or .com. We have a free library, and you can click and download the book, and you'll be able to read Heaven. Is it for real? Mm -hmm. Well, Pastor Doug, we're ready to go to the phone lines. We've got right. Anthony listening in New York. Anthony, welcome to the program. Uh, good evening, Pastors. How are you this evening? Doing well. Thank you. And uh, good, your good. question? Um, my question is, uh, it comes from uh, Numbers chapter 20, verse 11. Mm -hmm. um, and my question is, basically, if God did not want Moses to strike the rock the second time, why did he still allow water to come out? Because my thought is, is that, you know, if, if he struck the rock and no water came out, it, it, I think it would have prevented the people from believing that Moses was the reason for their blessings or even the problems that they had. And they would see that he had no power in and of himself. And I think it would probably have negated, you know, the reason for Moses to be forbidden to go into the, the holy city. And right. So, you know, at least you mean the holy I land. Yes. The Holy Land, that's what I mean, yes. Um, you know, if you look in verse 8, the same chapter, God spoke to Moses saying, Take the rod in your, uh, take uh, the rod, you and your brother Aaron, gather the congregation together, speak to the rock. See, he had, he had struck the rock once years earlier, a symbol of Christ being smitten for our sins, which Jesus is not to be smitten a second time for our sins or a third time. So God didn't even tell him to hit the rock. He said, just take your rod. It was a sign of his power. He used the rod in his hand whenever he did any of the miracles. He lifted up his rod before the sea parted and so forth. But he said, speak to the rock. And Moses, it's not just that he struck the rock, but he lost his temper before the people. He said, here now ye rebels, must we bring water for you out of this rock? So it was like they were taking credit. Now God honored them. Uh, keep in mind, God sometimes gives people uh, power and blessings, and they can abuse that. Samson had special strength, and he not only used that strength to fight the Philistines, the enemies of God, he used the strength to escape when he'd spent the night with a, a shady lady. <laughs> you know, he tore the gates off and, and got out of the city. So sometimes these gifts were given, and then, you know, they could be abused. Uh, Balaam was a prophet, but he abused this gift. Yeah, and absolutely. Now, children of Israel needed water at this point. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, as you mentioned, Pastor Doug, the water came from the rock as they wandered for those 38 years up to this point in the wilderness. They had gone close to the borders of the promised land. The water stopped coming from the rock. Mm -hmm. It was God's purpose that they would have faith to enter in. But because of unbelief, they ended up having to detour around the land of Edom, and they didn't have any more water. So they did need water. They began to murmur, and... It's interesting here that uh, Moses and Aaron have to be so faithful uh, so many times. Right at the end, it seems as though they, they took the credit for themselves instead of pointing the people to Christ. You know, I remember, and just one more thought on this, Anthony. I remember uh, talking to a gentleman. He said, you know, I went to an evangelistic crusade, and the evangelist, you know, told me if I prayed and accepted Christ, and that my life would change. And he says, I prayed, I accepted Christ, my life was changed. And then he later heard that that evangelist was living a double life. And the Lord answered his prayer mm -hmm. in spite of the 
the vehicle. And in the same way, Moses and Aaron disobeyed, but the people had been praying for water. So God answered their prayer, as John was saying. Mm -hmm. Does that help at all, Anthony? No, it, it does help a lot. And, and just to see that it wasn't just only him striking the rock, but the manner in which he did it as well, yeah. that, that helps me understand better. So thank you for that. All right. Thanks so much for your question. All right. We've got Jamie listening in Minnesota. Jamie, welcome to the program. Hi. Uh, good evening. Good pastors. evening. Uh, my question has to do with Jesus, and uh, was Jesus born spiritually blind, or did he have spiritual sight from conception? And uh, the, there's a, a verse, Isaiah 7, uh, verse 15, that I, I come back and I look at, and I think, is this the answer to that question? Where it says, curds and honey he shall eat, that he might know to refuse the evil and choose the good. Is that the verse right. you're talking about? Yep. Uh, well, the, the, this verse here, curds and honey, that is talking about the best of the milk. It, it takes the cream to make the curds. And honey is, you know, the land of milk and honey. But there are also, curds and honey are a symbol for the word of God. The Bible says, desire the sincere milk of the word, and the law of the Lord is compared to honey. And so it's saying in his mouth would be the word, the richest word. Uh, it wasn't just the word of a prophet, it was the word of the Messiah. And Jesus was really nursed on the word. You know, he was uh, fed by his mother, uh, not only naturally, but I think he learned the word at her knee. So by the time he's 12, he was able to confound and mystify the wise men in the temple with his questions and answers. Okay. So he did have to learn from the scriptures. Yeah, I don't think Jesus learned the Bible because of some supernatural straw that God was pouring into him. Jesus learned the Bible the same way we do. And it was brought to, you know, scriptures were brought back to him by the Holy Spirit, just like for us. But I think uh, he had to okay. read the Bible. You know, it says when he was, um, uh, went to church when he was a young man, he, in Nazareth, he stood up and he read the scriptures as his custom was. He went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. So it was a custom of Jesus to go to church on the Sabbath, read the scriptures. I think he had a very good memory and, a, you know, of course, a, a, an unusually sharp mind. Makes sense. That? Okay. Hey, thanks so much, Jamie. Hope that helps a little bit. And we appreciate Thank your you. question. You know, just one more verse on that passage. I was actually looking up while you're talking. Luke chapter 2, verse 52 Talking of Jesus, says he increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So there is a growth in wisdom or understanding or knowledge. So as Jesus grew older, he understood more and more of the scriptures. And we believe somewhere around the age of 12, when he went to the temple, uh, he began to understand more of his mission. Mm -hmm. And what a revelation that must be because he said to his parents, I must be about my father's business. And he was talking about his heavenly father. Right. And he grew in stature. Because he ate well, so it was natural food that made him grow in stature. Right. And it's the word of God that made him grow in, grow in wisdom. <laughs> the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All right, we've got Brett in uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee. Brett, welcome to the program. Hello, pastors. Uh, how are you doing today? Doing well. Thank you for calling. Thank you for taking my uh, call. So uh, my question is the, the job I'm going for in the military or tra trying to go for, if it's Lord's will, is a search and rescue job. But I'm also trained to handle a weapon because I'm, you might be uh, deployed to a uh, combat zone and stuff. Mm -hmm. And my question is about the Sixth Commandment. I believe it is, uh, thou shall not murder. And... Uh, like, if I have to, I hope and pray the day never comes, but if I have to take someone's life in the military, like, is that, like, self-defense or something like that? Because I know in the biblical times, like, there was God's people uh, had wars and different things. Right. You know, um, I, I'll just be very honest with you. That is a tough question because on one hand, there's no question that a nation needs an army to protect its freedom and its rights. Uh, right. it, it is true that if, if a soldier in, um, in fulfilling his duties 
must take life and he's following orders, he's not considered a murderer. Um, but at the same time, you know, Jesus said uh, those that live by the sword will die by the sword. And so Christians typically take a, a, a pacifist view when a Christian needs to enter the military to serve his country. Um, they often say, you know, I'd like to take a position where uh, I can be saving life. And as you said, not discharge a weapon. You know the story of Desmond Doss? Yeah, I actually, I love that movie. Uh, I actually, as I was watching it, I kind of had That's this That's what part of made you think me, about like, that. Yeah, like I, like, not that I might do what he did, but I might do something along those lines, like saving people like that. Right. Yeah, and by the way, he was a, a friend of mine. His uh, second wife was a member of a church I pastored, and so we got a chance to get really? to know him. Great guy, yeah. And then there's also, um, there's some other stories. You know, there's a testimony book by uh, Terry Johnson and um, and others who have said, you know, I'm, I want to serve my country. I am so thankful for the freedoms that we enjoy. I would prefer not to have a position where I have to make that moral choice of pulling the trigger. Oh, the other book is Frank Hustle, mm -hmm. A Thousand Must Fall. This man, he was in Germany. Amazing story. And he was pressed into the the uh, army, and he refused to carry a weapon. What he did is he carved a gun out of wood so he would never be tempted. And he kept a wooden pistol in his holster <laughs> through the entire war, and he never had to draw it, and no one ever found that it was wood. It's quite a story. A Thousand May Fall is, is the name of it. But, you know, everyone has to make that decision for themselves. Uh, the, one of the problems when you enter the military for a Christian is, you lose a certain amount of your freedom to say, this is my day of worship, and you know this is how I'm going to spend my time. You really are surrendering. I went to military school first when I was five years old, and then two more years between 11 and 13, and uh, that was just military school. And you are really at the beholden of someone else to tell you how you're going to spend your time. Mm -hmm. So you don't get to make a lot of free choices in the military. But, you know, David was certainly in the military. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Bible tells us John the Baptist, the soldiers came and said, what do we do? And he gave them advice. He didn't say, go away, wall. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, there's certainly a place for that. That sounded like sort of roundabout answer, but it's a tough question. Yeah. I don't know if that helped you at all. Yeah, it did. Thank you. All right. Hey, thanks so much, Brett. Appreciate your call. All right. We've got Paul listening in Arkansas. Paul, welcome to Bible Answers Live. Good evening, Pastors. How are you? Doing well. How are you? Oh, I'm good. So uh, I was listening to a pastor today, and he was teaching, preaching on uh, salvation. Uh, you know, once you're, you have re truly received the Spirit, and uh, your sins are forgiven, and uh, you do have eternal life. Um, I understand. Uh, and then he mentioned about uh, a few other things, but Towards the end, and I don't know if I uh, interpreted his uh, uh, his uh, uh, lesson correctly, but he was saying that even though we're saved uh, and we will go to heaven, we can experience a second death. And he said that second death would be during the uh, the one thousand year of millennium reign, where w when we stand before to be judged, whether once we were saved, what did we do with our time? It's not about good work, you know. We, you know, uh, uh, earning, but, you know, did we, uh, were we involved in ministry? Did we uh, share the attributes of love and sharing? Right. Or did we just, you know, uh, say, hey, you know, uh, it is what it is, so, you know, let's just, uh, you know, uh, go through life. And he said the second death would be that we would not reign or uh, rule over in the millennium, but uh, actually uh, be casted out. And, uh, and, 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 and I don't know if I heard that right, but I never heard a well, second death. Yeah, let, let me uh, jump in here. First of all, you know, I don't want to specifically comment on a particular pastor's sermon because you always want all that in context, but uh, no saved person is going to experience a second death with the exception of people like Lazarus, who <laughs> he died and Jesus rose him, and then he died again from old age or sickness, and he'll be raised again. But generally speaking, um, the the believers, they may die a natural death, but they will not die the second death. And many believers in the last days when Jesus comes, they don't die even a first death because they are transformed and they are caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Like Elijah, they just are translated. 
uh, but no believer will die the second death. You know, I heard a pastor say one time, if you're only born once, you die twice. But if you die twice, uh, am I getting that right? If you're, <laughs> if you're born once, you're going to die twice. But if you're born twice, you die once. There you go. <laughs> so you've got to be born again. Right. And then you only die maybe the first death. You know, I think the verse that you're referring to there, uh, talking about the second death, and you find this in Revelation chapter 21, verse 8, it makes it clear as to who receives the second death. It says the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the sexually immoral, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all liars shall have their part which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Mm -hmm. So it's quite clear that, that this is the final judgment that comes upon the wicked. That, of course, occurs at the end of the 1,000-year period that we read about in Revelation 20. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So I uh, hope that helps a little, Paul. Does that make sense? Yeah, uh, you know, I, I never heard before uh, about a second death, except for those who don't believe, of course, you know. Uh, but uh, like I said, maybe I uh, interpreted uh, his message wrong, but uh, I figured, well, it is Sunday, and uh, you're on the air, and uh, I've called several times, and you've always uh, uh, given uh, honest scriptural uh, uh, answers, so... God bless you guys. Well, thank you. Sure appreciate that, Paul. You have a good evening. You know, we do have a study guide talking about the thousand years called A Thousand Years of Peace. It's about Revelation 20 and the millennium. Mm -hmm. We'll send it to anyone who calls and asks. The number is 800-835-6747. That is our resource phone line. And you can just ask for the study guide. It's called A Thousand Years of Peace. We'll get that in the mail and send it to you. We've got Kirk listening in Canada. Kirk, welcome to the program. Hello, good night, um, Pastor. Evening. How can we help you? Yeah, yeah I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, gamble, in terms of gambling, gambling is wrong according to the Bible, right? Correct. Okay. Um, just wondering, in terms of investment in stocks and bonds, because gambling is basically putting in money with expecting a higher rate of return, right? Well, yeah, but I wouldn't put I would not put gambling in the same category as investing in a stock. And uh, do you want me to share with you what I think the uh, the reason is? Sure. All right. In in business everywhere, uh, business people will invest in an idea or a business, and as the business prospers, they're lending their money to the business to in, to you know trade and they get a percentage of the income. Even Jesus said in the parable of the talents, he said to the, um, the lazy servant, he says, that at the very least you could have invested my money with the bankers. And what banks do is they usually invest in stocks or businesses. And at my coming, I should receive my money with interest. Um, a s gambling is, it, it, you're not really investing in anybody's work. You're not investing in productivity. <laughs> What you're wanting to do is basically you want to win at the expense of everyone else losing purely based on chance. Now, it is true that there is some risk involved in business. If you're a farmer, <laughs> there's risk involved. Anything really, you know, any business you're involved, there's always risk. You can't name. It doesn't matter if you're a doctor or a carpenter. There's risk involved at, at, uh, in your job. So we're not talking about that kind of risk. We're talking about uh, trying to get something for nothing. Mm -hmm. And I think when it comes to the stock market in particular, there are different ways that one could um, invest in the stock market. Some would be more on the gambling side where mm -hmm. people are putting large amounts of money in a particular stock and then watching it and then taking the money out and putting the money back in. And they call it day trading, mm -hmm. going yeah. back up and down. Speculative trading. So that's right. And yeah. the goal for that is just to make money. But there is a type of investment where it's long term and it's pretty, it's pretty solid. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so I, I do think there's a difference. Uh, you know, the Bible says that, um, you know, God rewards work. And then there's a verse in Proverbs, and I forget the verse, it, but it, it says, uh, those that make haste to be rich will not be innocent. And what's happening when someone's playing a slot machine or poker or lottery, they're trying to get rich quick without work and without the thinking and investment or without time and waiting um, and, and that I think is, and you know, the other thing is you just look at the fruit in gambling. Um, people often get addicted 
uh, some people lose their retirement, they lose their families, or they lose their home. And, you know, we're here in Sacramento, not too far from Reno, and we've, we've met people before. Of course, you don't have to go to Reno anymore. They got bingo parlors. Uh, bingo casinos All not far away, yeah. So people lose a lot of money. It's very sad. All right, well, thanks for your, your call, Kirk. We've got uh, Tassie listening from Canada. Tassie, Tassie, welcome to the program. Oh, yes, good evening, pastors. And I have a question. Yes. <laughs> and <laughs> this question is, I, I got two questions, but I don't know if you're going to have time to, uh, you to answer them all. But anyway, my first question is, why Jesus being called the son of David when Jesus himself said in Matthew 22, 45, if David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? Yeah, that's a good question. It's, it's interesting. I think we had that question with our that's AFCO right. students yesterday. And that's talking about when, uh, and it's Psalm, that, that is actually, Jesus is referring to one of the Psalms mm -hmm. when uh, he asked that. And let me see here. I think I've got it right at my fingertips. Um, yeah, the Lord said to my Lord, it's Psalm 110, verse 1. And the, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. If Jesus is the Lord of David, then how could he also be the son of David? Well, Jesus is the Lord of everybody, but he came into the world as a man. He was a descendant of the line of David. Uh, Jesus is the creator of all life, and yet he was the son of Mary and Joseph. So, you know, it's just basically saying it's interesting how the creator in the incarnation became a creation. Mm -hmm. And there's two parts of, of Christ's um, humanity. Well, one hand you have his humanity. On the other side, you have his divinity. Jesus said before Abraham was, I am. So Jesus existed long before um, in his pre-incarnation, way back throughout all eternity. Uh, and then he took upon himself humanity and became, uh, you know, a man. So depending upon what aspect of Christ you're referring to, his humanity or his divinity, that would uh, give you a time frame. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, hey, Tess, you know, I appreciate your, your question. We are coming up on our mid-time break, so we might have to budget that to one question tonight. Uh, listening, friends, don't go anywhere. In a few minutes, we're going to be back with more Bible questions. And if you want to call in with your question, the number is 800-463-7297 to bring your question into the studio. I might also mention that all week long, Amazing Facts has programming available and if you go to the Amazing Facts website, that's simply amazingfacts.org, you're going to find there is a kaleidoscope, a virtual tree of life of information. Don't go anywhere. Coming back with more Bible questions. Stay tuned. Bible Answers Live will return shortly. If you enjoy hearing solid biblical answers on Bible Answers Live, you can have those same insights at your fingertips through the Amazing Facts Prophecy Study Bible. The updated hardcover version is available at its lowest price ever and includes the complete set of Amazing Facts 27 study guides, plus a Bible numbers and symbols chart and eight pages of colorful maps. This best ever Bible gives you a biblical cyclopedic index, words of Christ in red, chronology of the Old Testament, along with Doug Batchelor's How to Study the Bible feature, and much more. Call us at AF Bookstore to learn more about it at 1-800-538-7275. The Amazing Facts Prophecy Study Bible stands apart from other Bibles, giving you the same solid answers you hear each week on Bible Answers Live. Order your copy today at afbookstore.com or by calling 1-800-538-7275. What if you could know the future? What would you do? What would you change? To see the future, you must understand the past. Alexander the Great becomes king when he's only 18, but he's a military prodigy. 150 years in advance, Cyrus had been named. Rome was violent, they were ruthless, they were determined. The gospel writers see his death as a fulfillment of salvation. 
This intriguing documentary, hosted by Pastor Doug Batchelor, explores the most striking Bible prophecies that have been dramatically fulfilled throughout history. Kingdoms in Time. Get your copy today. Available now on DVD, Blu-ray, or USB. For more information, visit KingdomsInTime.com. You're listening to Bible Answers Live, where every question answered provides a clearer picture of God and His plan to save you. So what are you waiting for? Get practical answers about the good book for a better life today. If you have a question about the Bible or living the Christian life, call us now at 800-GOD-SAYS. That's 800-463-7297. Now, let's rejoin our hosts for more Bible Answers Live. Welcome back, listening friends, to Bible Answers Live, and some of you may be tuned in along the way. This is a live, international, interactive Bible study. We've been doing this for about 25 years. Every Sunday night, programs are replayed around the country, and we're broadcasting live on uh, satellite radio, as as well as many land-based stations, and on the Internet. And now, friends, we want you to do us a favor. Uh, We're doing a few pilot programs in our new studio before we go on TV, and we invite you to go and take a look at what's happening as well as taking a listen. And you can look and see by going to the Amazing Facts YouTube channel. You can also go to the Amazing Facts Doug Bachelor, I'm sorry, the Doug Bachelor Facebook uh, page. Is it the Doug Bachelor YouTube channel too, I think? I forget which one it is. You have to look and tell us. We might have both, yeah. Yeah. And that's the Amazing Facts Facebook page as, as well. And so we, we're in our new studio that uh, was recently constructed. And we're kind of getting things all set up technically for uh, doing this live on television on Sunday evenings. I am Doug Batchelor. My name is John Ross, and we're going to go to the phone lines. We've got Jason listening in Canada. Jason, okay, welcome we to the program. Jason, welcome to the program. Hi, can you hear me? We do, and I think you may we have do, had your radio you on. So you want to turn it down. Awesome. Yeah, let me uh, put that different. Okay, um, yeah, you know, my question was, I'm going to put this on speaker. Um, My question was, um, you know, how do you feel about uh, present truth, like a a more present truth that hasn't been revealed in the 1800s or in the Bible times, and also uh, major prophets, too, in these end times? Um, Because I, I truly believe that I'm one of them, and I have tons of things out there. Um, Jason Joan on like TikTok and YouTube and stuff. But anyway, so that was my question is how do you guys feel about present truth? Now you said you feel you're a prophet. Yeah, yeah, and I'm I'm like willing but to have what, why do you, me on this. But why, why do you think you're a prophet? You know, I've been into the the Adventist teachings and truth for a long time. And um I literally have dreams and I have um a lot of things that I put together and talk to, I've been talking to a massive amount of people, even um, Amazing Facts I've promoted for a long time. But, um, you know, I really feel God's Spirit working in me for a long time, and I've had feeling experience. And, um, you have know, you I looked, really feel like... Jason, oh, have ahead. you looked through the... I'm just wondering, and I'm not denying, you know, I believe there are going to be prophets yeah. in the last days, but you have to... You know, the Bible also says there'll be false prophets. So you've got to be real careful when someone says, yeah. I'm a prophet. They're basically saying God has given me a message that, you know, meets that criteria. Um, ha, do you know what the eight or ten, I think there's eight or ten criteria for determining if a prophet is a true prophet? Do you know what they are? You know, of course, living a clean life, you know, like the 144,000 are lit- no guile in their mouth. They're not defiled with other churches, other doctrines and things. And, you know, and I, I believe that there's other prophets in the music industry that are speaking in symbolism. And I believe there's lots of teachers in the music industry, but I believe Bob Dylan is, when we look at the symbolism and actually examine the words that he's saying, and he doesn't use hypnotic beats and, and, and rhythms and things like this. And he really explains a lot of stuff in great detail of things that are coming. And I think some go back and forth, too. But, um, you know, I, I truly believe there's a lot coming well, we let, I tell know, you what, and I, everything is going to be counterfeited. Jason, the devil has. Yeah. yeah, you know what I'd like to do? I'd like to send you our study guide, and I'll, I'll, tr- I'll answer your question, but just before I forget, we have a study guide on what are the criteria. There's about, I think it's eight or ten points 
that how do you determine if there's a true prophet? Because in the last days, we know there'll be many false prophets. I believe there'll be true prophets. I think, but for every true prophet, there's probably 10 false ones. And uh, I'd like for you to know, to start with, what are those criteria? And, uh, but yes, you know, uh, no question that uh, the gift of prophecy, and you look in 1 Corinthians 14, is one of the gifts of the church. If you look on Sunday morning through the TV channels, you're going to see a lot of different pastors say, thus saith the Lord, I've got this prophecy, and they, uh, they'll, they'll declare right and left, they're declaring their prophecies. There were a lot of evangelicals that were prophesying about the election, mm -hmm. and uh, see, about 75% were wrong. Okay. Uh, so y y we've got to be careful about uh, listening to everybody that says they've got the gift of prophecy. You know, the study guide you're referring to, Pastor Doug, it's a great read for anyone. It's called, Does God Inspire uh, Astrologists and Psychics? And it actually lists the biblical tests for the true gift of prophecy. And we'll send it to anyone who calls and asks. The number to call for that is 800-835-6747. You can ask for the study guide. Does God inspire s astrologists and psychics? And we'll get, it, get that in the mail and send it to you. All right. Hey, thank you, Jason. Appreciate that. We've got Ruth listening in Texas. Ruth, welcome to the program. Hi. Hi. Um, my Bible question, well, my question is, does, how many Jewish laws were broken the Friday that Jesus was crucified? Well, uh, let me think now. And and uh, it, it wasn't just Jewish laws, but uh, I think for one thing, they broke the law when they tried Christ that um, they weren't supposed to have a trial at night. Mm -hmm. um, so that was one. Um, they they falsely condemned him. And so they, they uh, perjured, meaning they lied, and they found witnesses that will lie. Um, the high priest rent his garment. And he's never supposed, supposed to, to do, do that. that. Uh, they didn't have a full Sanhedrin for the trial. They left out some of those who were friendly towards Christ, like Nicodemus. Yeah. So, yeah, they and then it went on and on throughout the whole day, the way they approached the whole trial of Jesus. And the yeah, some of the laws were, um, were probably not just Jewish laws, but it was a very unjust, uh, even by their own standards, it was a very unjust law. But um, I hope that, does that help a little bit, Ruth? Yes. It does. Okay. Well, thank Now, how old are you? Do you mind my asking? Um, no, I'm 12. You're 12. Well, I'm glad you're you're thinking deeply asking questions like that. You're making Pastor Ross and I scratch our minds and go, let me see how many laws were broken. <laughs> but they, they definitely broke some of their laws. And uh, we thank you for your question. You know, uh, Ruth and all those who are listening that might have young people, we do have a set of lessons geared for young people, for Anyone from 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, that age, it's called Amazing Adventure. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can go to the Amazing Facts website to find out more about that. Just look up Amazing Adventure, and it's a great set of lessons. Mm -hmm. All right, we've got Julie listening from Oregon. Julie, welcome to the program. Hi, thank you. Taking my call. Yeah. So uh, my question is First Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. All right. Can I read that for people listening? Certainly. All right. It says, uh, and you know, I probably ought to back up a little bit just to give the context. Sure. And it says in First Timothy chapter 4, Now the Spirit speaks expressly, saying that in the latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. Now here's verse 3. Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who know and believe the truth. Uh, for every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it's received with thanksgiving for it's sanctified by the word of God in prayer. So what particular part are you wondering about there, Julie? Okay, so um, I'm kind of wondering about the word creature. It says for every creature of God is good. Um, Are you wondering and, if that means every creature food? can be eaten? Or, yeah, and also, um, yeah, every creature. I mean, that <laughs> human beings are creatures, and pigs are creatures, and I just was wondering about um, what that meant. 
Yeah, Paul is speaking to a specific problem that was a great uh, controversy in the early church. The Jewish Christians, the Jews who had accepted Christ, were telling the Gentile Christians that they could not uh, eat animals that had been offered to pagan jo uh, gods. And uh, Paul was saying, look, you know, if, if you want to eat that chicken, a sheep or goat that was sacrificed in the temple of Jupiter, it doesn't really matter. You didn't offer it to a devil. You're asking God to bless it. Um, and then he says that these are the creatures that are sanctified by the word of God. So right there we know there are some creatures that you are not, according to the word of God, to eat. You are not to eat any unclean animals, but there are some that were sanctified. God said you can eat these and by prayer. And so uh, if a creature is going to be clean for food, it must be sanctified by the word of God, approved. And, and you'll find that list in Leviticus <laughs> uh, or by prayer. You know, another way you can translate the word sanctify there in First Timothy 4, verse 5, is just simply set apart. It comes mm -hmm. from the same root word. So, uh, for it is set apart by the word of God. Well, what meats are set apart by the word of God? Well, that would only be the clean animal. So, again, Paul is not saying here that you can just eat anything, because you're right, creatures is a very broad category. could include all kinds of things, but here it sets them apart by the word of God. And, and furthermore, there is a church... Uh, during the Dark Ages that forbade its priests from marrying, it says commanding to mm -hmm. not to marry, and to abstain from foods that God created to be received. Some foods were not created to be received, some were. For instance, you could eat fish. There's cer certain fish you could eat, but this church says you can't eat it except certain days of the week or something like that. And so it's pretty clear what uh, church it's talking about in this passage. Hey, thank you so much, Julie, for your question. We've got uh, TJ listening in Oregon. TJ, welcome to the program. Hi. Um, my question was uh, how I've, I've seen these videos of the, these like pastors healing people and I just wanted to know like how is it possible that I, I too can receive like be a healer? I want to know, how can I become a healer like what I've seen? All right. Well, uh, you know, I don't think that there is a 10-part um, a course that you can take online so that you can be a biblical healer. I believe that every Christian is able to pray for healing for themselves or for someone else. Um, Jesus told the disciples that you know, if someone in their church is sick, they can call for the elders of the church. And those are people of, you know, usually age and experience that, are, that meet the biblical conditions for being an elder. And they would come and they would pray for that person, anointing them with oil. Now, some of the healings that you see on the typical television channel, some of that is bamboozling circus uh, shenanigans. And it's not all for real. Uh, you know, I do believe in the power of prayer. I do believe in miraculous healing. Uh, I don't think you're going to see any prophet of God going around with a business card that says, you know, Pastor Smith, healer. Um, it, I, I think, you know, as a person is uh, sick and they're presented to believers, some people have gifts of healing, the Bible talks about, uh, through faith. But um, there's not really a course that you take and we can't say do point ABC and you'll be a healer. Well, you know, we have that verse, and I think you refer to it in James chapter 5, verse 14, where we have instructions given, if anyone is sick, let them call for the elders of the church, let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Now, this type of faith healing that you see on TV, usually it's, it's a big gathering, it's uh, sort of for a show, but that's not really following the counsel that we find given to us in the Bible. James is quite clear what one needs to do if they are sick. Call the local elders of the church, invite them to come, pray, anointing with oil, confessing sins. You don't see a lot of confessing of sin and um, the elders gathering for prayer. It's more of a show, these type of faith healers that you see. Yeah. You know, there's an experience in Acts chapter 8, verse 18, where there was this gentleman named Simon, and he saw how the apostles would lay hands on people and they would receive the Holy Spirit. He said, I'd like to have that power. And he said, here, I'll, I'll give you money mm -hmm. <laughs> to buy that power. And uh, Peter said, your money perish with you because you thought the gift of God could be purchased. It's a, one of the gifts of the Spirit, and God decides who gets what gifts. And so 
if you can pray and say, Lord, I want to know what the gifts are that you want to give me. What gifts of the Spirit? And everybody gets different, some kind of different gift, some multiple gifts. But the Lord will determine that. Hey, thank you, TJ. We got a call from Sydney, Australia. Uh, uh, Fady is listening. Hey, going? Doing great. Thanks for calling. That's good. Thank you. Um, I got a question about Habakkuk chapter one, verses five and six. All right. Yeah, let me read this for our friends. Look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded, for I will work a work in your days which you will not believe, though it were told you. For indeed I am raising up the Chaldeans, a bitter and a hasty nation, who marches through the breadth of the earth to possess dwelling places that are not theirs. And so your question in particular about that, did I read the right verses? Yes, you did. Um, because I'm Chaldean, so I'm a Syrian Chaldean, I was wondering if it's that us or someone else referring i think that's interesting i i uh, i'm 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 uh, intrigued to know that um the chaldeans were from babylon and during the time in particular of the reign of king nebuchadnezzar the second most people don't even say the second because he was the only one most people know about um he invaded uh, israel he conquered uh, jerusalem and he carried the children of israel captive but not only did he conquer Israel, he conquered uh, Lydia, he conquered Egypt, and he just swept through Mesopotamia. And that's why ha Habakkuk is saying, I'm telling you, I'm raising up a hasty nation and, and they're going to be um, going through the land. They're going to be a judgment on the ungodliness of these nations. And that's exactly what happened. If I understand okay. correctly, the Chaldeans were the ruling family. Uh, otherwise known as the Babylonians. So mm -hmm. you have the Balon Babylonians, they spake, spoke their language, but you have the Chaldeans who were the ruling family or one of the tribes connected with that, and they spoke Chaldean, and that eventually became sort of the royal language. Mm -hmm. And we have a portion of the actual book of Daniel, which is written in Chaldean. Mm -hmm. Got it. I thought it was Americans all that time. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah, this is a prophecy that happened before the Babylonian captivity and the prophecy of Habakkuk came true very vividly with the, the fall of Jerusalem and Nebuchadnezzar's conquest of the Middle East. Appreciate your call. Thanks. We hope we get more from Australia. Appreciate your calling, Fadi. All right. We've got uh, Arnie listening from North Carolina. Arnie, welcome to the program. Hi, Pastor Doug, Pastor Ross. Thank you for taking my call. Uh, is based on Revelation 19.21, and I'm reading from King James Version. Uh, it says, And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. My question is, who are the fowls represent? Well, you read other places in the Bible where whenever there was a great battle, there was often a lot of casualties on the battlefield. Even with David and Goliath, David said, you know, today I'm going to take your head from you and uh, you and the host of the Philistines are going to be eaten by the birds of carrion. I'm paraphrasing here, but um, there was often there'd be so many birds. Vultures actually have an incredible sense of smell. They're like sharks of the air. They can smell anything decomposing for 100 miles. <laughs> it's amazing. And uh, they darkened the sky after a battle. There were so many birds of carrion that would come in. I saw a big cloud of buzzards above a, a meadow. And I thought, what's going on? I rode down there, and there was a dead bear. And they came. I never knew there were so many buzzards in the country, but they somehow all found it. And... Um, so there are not literally going to be flocks and flots uh, of vultures and, and raptors. Uh, Revelation chapter 19 is using some symbolism. Yes, if you look at the whole context there, it's talking about the second coming of Christ. Here Jesus is described as coming as a king, bringing deliverance for his people and judgment upon the wicked. Mm -hmm. And uh, the slain of the Lord, as we read in other pace, places, will be on the earth from one end to the other. They won't be gathered. They won't be buried. Uh, and so here we kind of have that same description as uh, the wicked. They are destroyed and, so to speak, the birds are filled with their flesh. And again, it's the symbolism that comes from a battle scene in the Old Testament. Absolutely. So thank you, Arnie. We appreciate your call. 
and uh, we'll try and get one or two more while the time remains here. We got uh, Jamima from um, Canada, Richmond, Canada. Jamima, welcome to the program. Hello, good evening, Pastor Dog and Pastor Ross. Evening. And your question? Um, my question is from the book of verse of Isaiah 40, verse 25 to 31. So it says, those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount, mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And he gives power to the weak and to those who have no might, he increases strength. But it says here, even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. So what it says here, they shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. But why it says the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall? Why would they be weary and fall? Well, I think he's talking about those that do not fear the Lord, even their youth will get weary and the faint will fall, and their men, their soldiers will fall, but those who wait on the Lord. So it's contrasting those who wait on the Lord with the young armies. That, that See, right now when Isaiah gives this prophecy, uh, I've been doing a study on Isaiah the last few months, um, the people of Judah were being threatened by the Assyrians in the northern kingdom of Israel, and they were worried about attack. And Isaiah said, do not be afraid of them. But even their young men and their soldiers, they're going to they're going to get weary and faint. And youth often had, you know, that's why they recruit young soldiers. They have a lot more stamina. But he said, those who wait on the Lord, meaning of the nation of Israel, if you're faithful, if Jerusalem is faithful, says uh, you will mount up with wings like eagles. Turns out when Assyria did attack, God fought for them. And um, but it's also a promise for God's people through history that God renews the strength. You think about when Elijah. No, no. Uh, yeah, Elijah, when he prayed and the rain came down, it says he girded himself up. He ran before Ahab's chariot and he had like this supernatural strength. He mm -hmm. was running and he was not weary. And he also went through the wilderness uh, for 40 days and 40 nights running and not being weary. And so God can give supernatural strength to his people. All right. Well, thanks for your call, uh, Jamima. We got uh, Robert listening in Minnesota. Uh, Robert, welcome to the program. Good evening, Pastors. So, I had a question about where is there anywhere in the Bible where we can interpret the dream was of God? Yeah, you know, uh, that's a good question because, um, you know, you, you read in the Bible about Daniel who had this gift of dream interpretation and Joseph who had the gift of dream interpretation. I'm trying to think of a third. Uh, I think there are some others that interpreted dreams. But, um, Okay, of course, Joseph, Jesus' father, was given dreams, but I think the angels interpreted what they were. Um, usually, if God's going to give you a dream, you don't have to worry about where's the interpretation going to come from, because if God wants you to know, he will provide either the interpretation or an interpreter. So if you have a dream and you're wondering, was that from the Lord? You just pray and say, Lord, if that's from you, help me to understand it. He may do it by just giving you uh, some understanding of what it means or he may send somebody that has that gift now i don't know too many people that i've met that have the gift of interpretation you got to be careful about people that uh, say you know for 995 i'll tell you what your dream means and of course not all dreams have uh, spiritual significance <laughs> the bible speaks of out of the abundance of the affairs of the day people sometimes have dreams that could relate to well, things you've been thinking about yeah it could relate to <laughs> what you had for supper. So not all dreams are necessarily from God. That's right. As a matter of fact, 99.9999% of dreams are the result of your brain defragmenting through the night the things that you've been thinking about. And I've often find my, my dreams are somehow associated with things I was stressing or thinking about or just experiencing in recent days. So uh, I hope that helps a little. Uh, Pastor Ross, can we get in one more caller maybe before uh, we, we run out of uh, program time tonight? Yes, we've got Donna listening. Um, Donna, welcome to the program. Rhode Island. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening, Pastor Doug. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for calling. Well, thank you for taking my call. Um, my question is I've been talking with someone um, a little bit about 
my beliefs. And my question for you is because I haven't really been able to tell her in the Bible where it says um, about tithing. Yeah. And she asked if tithing was a requirement for salvation. Well, here's what I would say about that is giving is a requirement of salvation. And it starts with giving your heart to the Lord. The, the whole attitude of the Christian is God so loved the world he gave. It's one of giving. Uh, you know, God is a giver. A and when you give the Lord your heart, he actually owns 100% of you. It's like that king in the Bible said, all that I am and all that I have are yours. And when you come to the Lord, that's our prayer. All that I am and all that I have is yours. Now, one of the ways we show our faith in the Lord is by uh, giving a percentage of our income, 100% belongs to him, but he says, I want you to show your faith in me by returning a tenth, which that's where you get the word tithe. You find that in uh, Leviticus, in Malachi chapter 3. I think the specifics of tithe is also seen in Jacob promising God a tenth if God would bless him and bring him back. And Abraham gave a tenth to Melchizedek. They were to give a tenth to the priests to support the work of God. And Jesus even referred to tithe and saying, do not leave it undone, Matthew 23, 23. But I gotta, I'm got i talking fast because I can see the clock and we've just got seconds left. Hey, I hope that helps a little bit, Donna. We do have a lesson called um, In God We Trust. And uh, if you call 800-435-6747, I'm sorry, 835 -6747, you can get a copy of In God We Trust. And so listening friends, we are sorry, but we're out of time for tonight. We hope you've been blessed and learned something. We hope that you, if you didn't hear it all, you can go to the Doug Batchelor Facebook page and you can see the program archived there. We will study his word together, God willing, again next week. Thank you for listening to today's broadcast. We hope you understand your Bible even better than before. Bible Answers Live is produced by Amazing Facts International, a faith-based ministry located in Granite Bay, California. What if you could know the future? What would you do? What would you change? To see the future, you must understand the past. Alexander the Great becomes king when he's only 18, but he's a military prodigy. 150 years in advance, Cyrus had been named. Rome was violent, they were ruthless, they were determined. The gospel writers see his death as a fulfillment of salvation. This intriguing documentary, hosted by Pastor Doug Batchelor, explores the most striking Bible prophecies that have been dramatically fulfilled throughout history. Kingdoms in Time. Get your copy today. Available now on DVD, Blu-ray, or USB. For more information, visit kingdomsintime.com. Journey back through time to the center of the universe. Discover how a perfect angel transformed into Satan the arch-villain, the birth of evil, a rebellion in heaven, a mutiny that moved to earth. Behold the creation of a beautiful new planet and the first humans. Witness the temptation of evil. Discover God's amazing plan to save his children. This is a story that involves every life on earth every life. The Cosmic Conflict. If God is good, if God is all-powerful, if God is love, then what went wrong? Find out what the critics are raving about. Top scholars and theologians from around the country come together to reveal the hidden history of the Book of Revelation. With powerful reenactments and incredible visual effects, this 95-minute masterpiece brings to life the book of Revelation like never before. Revelation is no longer a mystery. Get your copy today. Visit iTunes or afbookstore.com. If you'd like to enhance your study of God's Word, 
visit our website at www.amazingfacts.org and sign up for our free Bible study course. And make sure to check out our online bookstore at afbookstore.com, which offers thousands of inspiring books, DVDs, and more to help you get the most out of God's Word. To take advantage of the offers you've heard on this broadcast, call us at 800-835-6747 or visit our website at amazingfacts.org.